development management uh, so this is something uh, isdm is a very like it's one of like the fountain heads like you want to become like uh, for this particular thing uh, development management in the field of so like i would ask like what made you think that there was a need uh, for such an institution in this field and how this journey of isdm began sure. so i worked in the corporate world for you know almost 25 years and then came to the sector about 10 years ago and i was in azim premji foundation um, and that was the best accident that it's an accident because i didn't want a 9 to 5 job but i ended up there that turned out to be a fantastic thing for me uh, yes. one because it gave me the opportunity to work you know from Tarkashi to Pondicherry and from Barmet to Dhamtari, uh, and we were used to travel 15, 20 days a month, and, uh, and really enjoyed being uh, in rural India. And uh, I used to see amazing people doing amazing work, but struggling to you know grow their organization, build partnerships, manage some risk, manage cash flows, uh, hiring people, retaining people. and these are things which for me seem like such easy challenges matlab from a management perspective it felt like are this is so but what they had figured out was a more complicated part you know how to teach girl children from the most oppressed background is far more complicated than, than doing some you know cash flow management yeah so i used to think they are they have figured the more difficult part but they are struggling with the easier part in some ways so that was one thing that i felt if only they could have the management expertise to build organizations to build teams to build resources and use it the ideas that they have they could have far greater impact that was one side the management seems to be required for the sector on the other side my own personal experience at azim premji foundation i would come up with these ideas and fortunately azim premji had a lot of people to talk to and they would tell me how idiotic the idea was and you know open my eyes to that so i realized that you know the natural way of a business management mind does not fit into the social sector so this was a challenge right the social sector needs management but the management that is available currently which is what is widely practiced in the business world is does not fit here so this question was management is required but what is that management this management doesn't fit so that was really the origins of let me figure out what is the management that is suitable for social sector organizations and will achieve for them what management achieve for the business world you know so that was really the uh, origins this this conundrum of management is required but this management doesn't work and thereby what is it uh, that is required and we went around the world and looked and we found that most places had not accepted that idea that this requires a very different way of management the tendency was to take management understand the sector and apply it versus figure out the management for the sector itself and uh, you know nowadays i say that there is management equality in the world so the level of management theory sciences research practice for the state and markets like you know samaj and sorry sarkar and bazaar is very intense whereas if you look at the social sector ka management there is like So little, little. Yeah. so there's like one serious inequality. So today, the ability of a business or a government to use data, use technology, make decisions, we see the impact. Sector me to hai hi nahi. So there's a severe management inequality that's almost happening. So really, that was the origins of saying, no, boss, we need to put spotlight. We need to get people to understand. No, we have to figure out what is the management required for this space. So let research करना है, faculty चाहिए, students चाहिए. So that's how it started. And how has it been till now? Uh, yeah, I... So it's been really fantastic. Uh, one from a personal journey and one from an ISDM journey. So I'll give you both perspectives. Personally, because when I started, you know, in 2015 with this question, the articulation was not clear. There, कुछ तो चाहिए. There's something wrong here. Management is required, but this management does not. Today, I can say with lots of clarity and conviction that, you know, management is required, and it's required because the way management has to look at issues is far more complex uh, far more intersectionality to the problems that need to be addressed 
far more long term in the nature of the problem and the nature of the solution whereas in the business world decisions are like i say qsqt quarter to quarter ka okay that doesn't work here there it is largely financial and quantitative that doesn't work here there the problems and opportunities are fairly straightforward kisi ko coca cola peena hai kisi ko ipod kharidna hai kisi ko maruti jalana so fairly straightforward problems versus you know understanding dignity and equality and stuff like that so now i have lot more class so that's been my personal journey isdm i think came in uh, at a very uh, right time because increasingly uh, the money is available in the sector was increasing people wanted to you know really do bigger uh, impactful things and the country had lots of uh, uh, i call them spo social purpose organization not for profit for profit correct me but that uh but there was still i mean half a billion people in poverty in the country look there is money there is organization there are passionate people but the impact was not happening so the need for how do you create organization that can have impact at scale in sustained ways was becoming uh, very high so the demand was very high the resources was very high so timing wise it was fantastic so isdm came almost at the right time that was not by design obviously so that was one good thing and because of that it got fantastic support from some of the greatest minds in the country and even internationally sc bihar kushar shah arun maira so really amazing people and philanthropic support so money is to actually set it up uh, so i think isdm was really fortunate and um, you know i i say this to people that when we started we were four people who didn't have money didn't have any family name didn't have any you know companies and you know whatever most universities in the country are built by people like that either the government builds it or a pmg or a tata or a whatever right and how can a ravi sridharan imagine that he can build a national institution but it's amazing how the world has conspired to you know money comes in people come in the intellectual capital comes in it's been an amazing journey at isgm that's great and so like uh, i would just like to connect like what you said like uh, ISDM came at a very right time. Uh, just like that, sir. Like uh, in uh, today's time, uh, everyone is dependent on technology, especially uh, especially the education sector for each and everything. So at the moment, sir, there are like various disruptive technologies uh, which will be very essential uh, for continuing education in the coming times. How is ISDM preparing itself for this shift uh, for the over, like the dependence on technology and all yeah no in fact for us our entire strategy is uh, is anchored on technology i'll i'll explain what our strategy is and give you an understanding no. very simply put so we have finished four years of work now and we said this was the proof of concept phase jabki we are now convinced that this development management is an idea this curriculum works this sort of thing needs to be done but to have impact you need to do it at scale because you need organizations across the world if not the country to adopt you know development management principles not management principles uh and and there is talent coming there is you know all that is happening so the proof of concept is done so we've sat and decided what our strategy for the next 10 years so the strategy is essentially two legs one leg is how do you build a knowledge power in how do you build the knowledge the case studies the theories the research and imagine this like a knowledge powerhouse which is now available for the world and we are a not for profit so everything is available free of cost now we have to figure out how to distribute it to the world and people say this is not only india this is relevant in all the five continents so the second part we want to build is what we call the transmission network yeah. which means how do i disseminate how do i do programs how do i do distance how do i learn from each other but technology is not only in this dissemination technology is also in the knowledge creation so how do you use artificial intelligence to start curating all how do you use machine learning to process you know large volumes of knowledge so that you can come up with you know useful insight how do you use um, uh, big data to analyze and use evidence based you know sort of decision making so it's there as part of the knowledge we want to use technology so to curate knowledge and to create knowledge and for the dissemination which means the programs the you know sort of courses the teaching the faculty the interaction from everywhere 
for both we want to use digital so we say that we are building a digital backbone is our core to our strategy and the two levers are knowledge and dissemination very integral okay. to what we are doing okay thank you for uh, that answer sir uh and now coming back to the current uh, scenario like use of technology in education has become very much important during the times of covid uh when things back uh, back to normal and i'm sh- like definitely they will in a very short span of time what role do you see edtech playing in the education space uh, te- technology is now become part of our lives right i mean you would be foolish to say that nay nay it's not relevant i can't it doesn't make any sense it's like saying you know i will not use mobile phone you know then then what then maybe 20 years ago people said yeah mobile phones kya bakwas hai it's an inter inter interruption it's a privacy thing it's a whatever but today how many people can live without a mobile phone it's yeah, part of your life right yeah. you have to recognize that world will keep changing and you have to keep adapting to it now i don't believe in technology for example replacing a teacher type level i think the the process of learning of a child is very human it's based on you know the 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 sort of you know the limbic system the nervous system the learning psychological processes and all that that is not going to change but how i teach how i develop teachers how do i create materials how do i bring knowledge to be available how do i uh complement what i can do in class with what the child can do outside the class or students can do outside the class it is super important to think about technology i think you're fooling yourself by saying that ne ne technology ka koi matlab i agree when you say technology ka koi matlab nahi hai in the way the student learns so the fundamental learning process you have to understand but once you understand that then you have to figure out how to leverage technology the problem that happens sometimes is people use technology without understanding the fundamental process so for example there was an idea that won the you know the best idea of the year award at google which was this idea of a hole in the wall so it came out of india only and they said you put a computer and then bachche seek that and it sounded very cool but you forgot that there is a process you have to connect learning to the child's background the existing knowledge of the child etc etc so i think that phase we have crossed now where where we just create a you know sort of magical app and it will solve the problem that i think is now gone but that you can leverage technology to significantly complement what you are doing is a huge opportunity and i'll give you a school education example it's not yet today but i feel it will happen so in the old days in india we had the gurukul system sure yes the gurukul system the beauty of it was i could give one on one attention to the child so there would be a seven eight children one teacher we would sit together we would go into the forest we would learn from the practical all that what happened is the population explosion happened industrial revolution happened schooling system became like a shop floor class 1 class 2 class 3 you get one specialized teacher to do it like you will do in a shop floor one guy fixes the drilling one guy fixes the lathe one guy so that's the system we have created which is a disaster because students are actually unique every child is unique you can't have one standardized like now technology can actually customize it so if this child likes to see pictures and learn i can customize it for that child this child likes to listen and learn i can customize it for the child this child likes to read and learn i can customize it for that child this child likes activities to learn i can customize so imagine what technology can do i can actually bring the gurukul back but at a mass scale so there are amazing things that you know technology can do but needs to be thought through carefully and it needs people who understand education processes pedagogy processes and andragogy processes to work with the technology experts and then you know sort of what happens when a technology expert decides ki i will now show how to teach then you have a problem so also uh, with the emphasis on technology these days uh, a very recent like a discussion has also started which is not new but has Im- has shown us its emergence again is basically uh, on the lines of digital divide like when you use a lot of technology there has like a, in a country like india there is there are people who are not able to have that technology at their disposal so how do you think like the development sector can play its role in addressing this issue especially in the education sector yeah so 
See, the thing about the divide is that has nothing to do with technology. Anything you have in, in the world, there is a divide, right? And invariably, the weaker sections will not get the benefit. The stronger sections will get the benefit. That is the story of the world, which is the unfortunate reality. So anyone saying that technology is causing a divide, I would disagree with that. Technology, like everything else, is causing a divide. Mobile phones also, there is a divide. Computers, there was a divide. Even with textbooks, there was a divide. Even with reading and writing, there was a divide, right? So that's one thing I want to put aside. But are there opportunities being created? And I'll give you an interesting work that one of my friends is doing with digital, this organization called DEC. Earlier, you were literate only if you can read and write. And if you didn't know how to read and write, you could not read books, which means your knowledge could never progress. Right, So you were then doomed for ignorance. Today, because of technology, I can use audiovisuals. I don't need to read and write today. Suddenly, you know, the person who's never gone to school can understand, you know, very complicated concepts, you know, of how should agriculture be done? How should fishing be done? What could be some value chains for, you know, custard apple? What could be, you know, what are the rights of, uh, you know, people? What are the prices of things? Suddenly, I'm able to do this without able to read and write. So the definition of what is literate has been redefined by technology. The literacy it does not mean read and write anymore because I can hear and I can you know see. So those are all great. So I think the the the, the social sector which is permanently fighting this divide has to figure out on two fronts. One is what are the new opportunities to break the divide. That's one thing. Second is, of course, to try and reduce the divide, which is, you know, for example, we must put pressure on the government system to make technology as widely available as possible. It should be like a fundamental right, if you ask. Access to technology, internet, has to be a fundamental right of the citizens of this country. If you want to be this knowledge economy, you want to be this country, and there are countries that have done it today. They've made the access to technology and the digital world free and available to everyone. So we also have to think on those lines. The beauty is that it's far easier to do that than for me to build schools in every village in this country. It's That's because of technology has that beauty, right? You can do it and spread it very fast. So there is a lot of work we have to do. One, by at the grassroots level, which is trying to help people understand that Abhi Padai Likhai is a very new idea and thereby leverage that to increase knowledge levels, literacy levels and stuff like that. The second is, of course, putting pressure on the on the system to make sure the system is designed in a manner in which there is equal access. And once you have equal access, then you're breaking the inequalities and the divides that happen. So I think there's many levels at which social sectors work. Social sectors work at the grassroots level. The social sector has to work at the interventions and designing of education sort of level. The social sector has to work with the government and policy level to make sure that you know access is provided. I mean, the Kerala today does uh, classes on television. You know, so it's it's at least now available to a large section. I'm saying even now TV may not be available to everyone. But so we have to figure out how do we use low bandwidth, how do we use fast transmissions, how do we use low cost access as far as possible, free access. So at four or five levels, I think you need to work. I'm moving to technology, I would uh, talk, would want to talk about uh, the National Education Policy 2020 that has recently came in. And uh, first, I would would want to like understand like uh, how do you see NEP 2020 impacting ISDM and its work? So ISDM is a very small entity in the larger context of NEP. NEP has got much, much bigger, you know, sort of uh, problems to solve from foundational education to teacher education to early childhood to different categories and levels of teaching. So NEP is a far bigger thing. So I would not say that ISDM is now, you know, the center of that. But having said that, see the general direction of every policy, right? To be honest, between you and me, policies have been coming since, you know, 1800, you know, and it's not like, look at the 1800, 87 Kolkata Commission report, if you look at a new education policy, 70 to 80 percent is the same. You know, there's not it's in the execution and all that. But coming I mean, specifically to us, we are a very unique institution because we are outside of the system. So we are not in the UGC, we are not in the AICT. Because we are a innovation in many ways. You know, it's a new idea which doesn't fit into the standard template of discipline-based teaching, 
grades that are given, assessment structures that are there, PhD is teaching. Because for us, our teacher could be a school dropout. Uh, for us, assessments are formative far more than summative. So there's a lot more related to the learning. Uh, a lot more of field work. You know, UGC system will say you can't have more than 10% of field work. So we have created it, which is designed for this space. But I think the good thing, and I, it's not specifically stated in the NEP, but directionally, the NEP wants to acknowledge new ideas and progressive ideas of higher education. Oh, yes. It is very powerful. For them. And that means that directionally, there is space for these sort of uh, today, it might be an experiment, you know, in, in a decade, it might be mainstream. So I think that opportunity is huge for ISDN. Then there are other things like, you know, obviously the whole, uh, you know, international universities can come into the country. I don't know how that's going to pan out, but, you know, our ability thereby to leverage knowledge from all around the world is also going to significantly increase. Uh, get faculty from around the world is going to increase. Um, using of technology, like you said, right? I mean... The, and the final thing is, see, at the end of the day, we are a postgraduate program, right? And I have to depend on students that come through the system. If the system produces students that are not good at writing, that are not good at critical thinking, my program becomes that much weaker. So if yeah. the system yeah. improves, it will automatically improve, you know. So in that way, I think there's a lot of benefits for ISDM from the uh, education policy. Uh, but the specifics, and there are more generic benefits than specific benefits. Uh, just like uh, NEP, like uh, in this NEP, there has been a provision like in higher education, it is stated that one of the major problems has been the rigid separation of disciplines, uh, different, different between science stream, art stream, commerce stream and all those things. But NEP 2020 talks about giving more freedom to students in choosing their disciplines. How do you see this change materializing in future? So, for example, one of the reasons we won't be approved by UGC is we are not discipline-based. Mm -hmm. We are a transdisciplinary, you know, sort of an issue. It's not even multidiscipline. You know, NEP is still talking about multiple disciplines. I can go here. I can. Ours is transdiscipline. How do you combine sociology and history to understand social issues, right? So that's the kind of work we do. So it's moving in that direction to say that institutions like ours which are not based on discipline, which are transdisciplinary in nature, but are solving societal issues, uh, become more relevant. And, and it opens up. That's why I feel that directionally, NEP is moving in that direction of saying, let's stop being disciplinary. Let's make it more open. So it's creating more spaces for real solutions for you know world's problems. And I really like, and I believe we are going in that direction, uh, to be honest. Uh, regarding management and your own personal experience and all so leadership is a very key aspect of management and so what according to you uh, is like is what it takes to be a good leader in the development sector that's a very uh, that's a very very good question but also a very complex question but I'll try and see if I can answer it in somewhat um, a lighter way. Lighter way meaning not trivially, but in a, a simpler way. Um, so the, the first thing is that, and, and I'm using this as my own example. Okay. So when I look at my time, and I've been at very senior roles in the corporate world, and since then now I've been in the social sector. In the corporate world, and I, you know, I don't know how people will take to what I'm going to say because it's somewhat controversial. I always felt I was on stage. There is Ravi at home and there's Ravi, the CEO of the bank. Yeah. Okay. So I, so I was always, I was a good actor, like actor, not in a, in a shamming or fraud sense, but I was doing something that needed to be done for that role. My stage, today I am this role, so I'm going to do that role. I'll do that till the play is over. After the play is over, I have nothing to do. I'll remove that dress. I'm back home. Whereas in my role here, it is me. And that is a very big difference. I don't know whether people will understand who are listening to this conversation. But the big difference for me is there, it's a role. Here, it's a life. And that for me is a very big difference between the leadership in the, social, in the corporate world and the leadership here. Here, you can't play a role. 
you know you can't do this put on a costume and do a role cannot be done because it is it has to go down to your inner self it is about your value system it's about your belief it's about you there it doesn't matter that i think banking is a corrupt uh, industry never bothered me i am following the laws of the land i am not doing anything wrong by the laws of the land but that i am making more money for the richer and the poorer are probably becoming less uh, more poor never bothered me there because i just put on my dress whereas when i came out i would say oh these bankers are the biggest corrupt people that have come out so it was a role kya farak padta hai mujhe jana hai i have to do that role end of the month i will get salary check happiness and i was not doing anything wrong i was not i never felt i was doing anything wrong but here that question doesn't arise there is no separate ravi who is doing the role of the role in azim prem ji or the role in isdf because that is me and uh, and that's what gives me a lot of i say this to people who want to cross over the satisfaction of working in the sector is if you want to be yourself and if you want to be yourself it that's the easiest thing to do because i don't need to now behave like the ceo of a bank ravi believes that equity is a very important thing fairness is very important people have to be treated with respect you don't have a right to get angry whatever it is right those are my value system and my idea of what a good society is and that's what i go do at work that for me is a very big difference but on a more sort of a theoretical basis you know in a manager's role in a corporate work there's a lot of management efficiency that i need how do i efficiently use the resources to maximize the output to generate the return for the shares so it's a lot of management efficiency is here it's not about management efficiency management efficiency is just the top layer of it there's a lot more to do with the equity aspects the impact aspect and other ideas of what a, a society has so this is a far more complex uh, leadership challenge than i had in the corporate world and here thereby your belief system your value system your ethical systems all that become very very critical uh sir are there any uh, new programs in the pipeline uh, for isdf which will be coming up yeah, so two things one is that the existing program has been significantly sort of uh, changed based on our first three years experience talking to alm stock so both are anyway is new but uh, what has happened is your earlier question right which is because of covid suddenly people have found that distance learning is acceptable you know uh, earlier if i had to do fundraising meeting in the us they would say agle baar jab us aaoge milte hain abhi main message bhejta hu kal ko i have a meeting in new york you know it's unbelievable how the world has changed so one of the things we are doing is building the digital infrastructure so once we build that digital infrastructure we will be able to design far more you know permutations combinations of programs and for different segments of people so one of the thing we will definitely do is start doing online program or people who are working can't take the time off and come and study so for that group we have definitely going to do and that that will be a whole series of programs that we going to do but the other one which i really want to talk about which is unique and very new uh, and it's still drawing board stage so in that sense it's not even new is we are building an excellence framework for social purpose organizations there is nothing like this in the social sector you what is the imagination how do you define what is an excellent organization and how do i as an organization know ki what are the opportunities for me to improve and be able to become more a higher or better on the excellent faith uh, and what does excellent mean in the first place so that is going to be a very big contribution because that then can be used by organizations in the sector however they want and we want to technology enable it so that even the small organization otherwise what happens the small organization working in the vernacular in chatisgarh is not benefiting from isd in work whereas if i can now technology enable it create a model people can look at it play around with it then they start realizing acha humko to we need more money or we need to improve our competence or we need better partners because we can't do everything or whatever you know the way we look at our results need to be redefined so we can start doing that so this excellence framework that we are building is a really powerful and new thing so online programs and this whole excellence model i would say a new thing that will arrive thanks uh, we'll be like uh, definitely looking forward to both of them uh, both the digital infrastructure and all and then this excellence framework thing uh, this, thank you so much ravi all right